We will not have lectures next week. Yes. There's not supposed to be a lecture on Tuesday because of the election day. And I will not be in Israel on Thursday, so we will resume back our, our meetings uh, the week after that. Right? So we will Tuesday, not next week, but uh, that's 12 days from now, something like that. Um, then I figure out that we only have two more weeks left to the end of the semester. So <laughs> it's a very short semester, which is unfortunate because there are, you know, we're getting to more and more interesting stuff, to my opinion. We don't really have time to um, discuss them, but uh, you know, the other occasions. So we're talking about the Iraq equation. Last time, <coughs> I won't repeat everything we said about the Iran equation, but I will. Um, what I want to do today, so again, we have a longer than usual uh, lecture today because I want to compensate for the, the lost uh, time. Uh, so I want to do two, maybe three things. So, first is to complete the discussion about the Iran equation. Then we're going to speak about isospins and something a little bit about uh, labor and what's called the CKM matrix, uh, about the weak interactions, because we will not really have time to discuss weak interactions. So we'll discuss that today, and then you will practice that. I already put your next problem set uh, online. Uh, and then if you have time, and uh, if you manage to survive, then uh, uh, we'll start speaking a little bit about gauge theories, which is quite fascinating to my view. Um, just out of curiosity, right, there is a really, it's relatively very few students around here today. Do you know why any of you? Students are fed up with... Um, yeah. they feel they've had enough. If I say there is going to be an exam at the end, is that true? <laughs> no, that's, I, I talked to the... Another thing which I, I should announce, right? You have not yet get gotten back your homework, which I know, and this is not okay. Uh, the issue is that there was an issue finding uh, somebody to grade your homework. We did find somebody. I met her today, and she will start grading your homework sometime soon, hopefully. Um, unfortunately, this is delayed. I'm aware of that. I'm sorry for that. This is uh, this is not fine. That's what we have right now. Again, it's part of the big mess of this year. So we spoke about solutions to the Dirac equation. Just remind you, right? So the Dirac equation, we wrote it in a, uh, in a covariant form, which is much easier to, uh, uh, to work with. Mm -hmm. I, gamma mu, d mu, minus m, mm -hmm. psi is equal to zero. And then we look for solutions. And then we said that um, we first solve the four particles at rest. And for particles at rest, we found that the solution would be one at rest. The solutions were quite simple. U1 was a 1, 0, 0, 0. U2 was a 0, 1, 0, 0. U3 was a 0, 0, 1, 0, and the U4 was 0, 0, 0, 1. And we saw that they had the spins plus minus 1 half. Right? S, Z, U1, plus half U1, and plus minus for U2 was U4. And then we looked for a general solution. Namely, a particle that is not at rest, but is moving in some direction, and then we found out that the solution are now u1 of e and p is 1, 0, e, z over e plus m, uh, px plus i, p, y over e plus m, u2 was again of E and P of course was a zero one PX minus I PY over 
e plus m minus bz over e plus m. U3 was a bz over e minus m, ex plus ipy over e minus m, 1, 0. U4 was a px minus ipy over e minus m, pz minus over e minus m, 0 and 1. Okay, so we got four solutions. And then we said that these last two solutions really represent antiparticles. And we wrote down V1, V1, V1 of E and P um, is U4 of minus E and minus P, and V2 of E and P is U3 of minus e and minus p. So rather than u3 and u4, we replace that. We say v1 and x minus So rather than that, we replace that with um, v1, which is p x minus i p y over e plus m minus p z over e plus m is 0 1 and v2 which is p z over e plus m p x plus i p y over e plus m 1 and 0 and then I was asked a very clever question, which forced me a little bit to think, and I didn't give you the right, uh, didn't give you an answer for that, which was okay. So you know, these are general solutions. Basically, these are the eigenstates, right? So if we have a particle which is in some sort of a combination, right, and we said this represents fermions, so such as the electron. So does that mean that an electron is really a superposition of an electron and an anti-electron? Right, we have a part superposition of particles and antiparticles. And from that, the answer is yes, right? Because we have a superposition of four spinors. But this is not the full story, right? Um, the full story is not given here, and it's not given to you, it's given in the framework of quantum field theory. And in that framework, the uh, spinors, or the, the Dirac spinors, turn into operators that operate on a vacuum. If you've heard the term second quantization, that's what it really means, in a sense, right? Here we took, the first quantization is that we take a measurable quantities such as energy and momentum and turn them into operators. That's what we do in quantum mechanics. In quantum field theory, we take the wave function, in this case the spinors, and turn it into operator as well. Operating on what? Yeah. On the vacuum state, right? And uh, we have a set of each of these operators get to uh, some combination of uh, raising and lowering operators. Uh, the same thing that you have in simple harmonic oscillator and quantum mechanics, the, the math is pretty much the same. And in a particle, what you have is a set of an operator, one a rising operator and one a destroying operator, raising of a particle, destroying of an antiparticle, and vice versa. So in reality, once we do, so from here you cannot see it, but once we quantize that, which again, we're not going to do it here, but this is what is being done in the realm of quantum field theory, then you'll see that the electron and positrons are actually separated. So an electron is a superposition of a state with plus and minus spin until we measure it, right? And then we know what the spin is, but not of the antiparticle state. And the same is true for, for positron. But again, you cannot see it from here. This doesn't tell you that. Right? So this uh, answers that question. Uh, then we spoke about operators uh, on the antiparticle spinors. And specifically, we spoke about the parity operator. The parity operator P. We said that under parity R goes to minus R. 
and t does not change, so it is t. And we show that this uh, uh, parity operator is in fact equal to this matrix gamma zero. There we have. Um, and we said the importance is that the parity is a multiplicative operator um, that can help us tell when a certain process can, can take place. If we're not, you're going to get homework on that today. Uh, the last thing that we spoke about, though I did not do the full derivative, but it can, find, it can be found on my lecture notes, which are now uh, on the web page. Possibly this is the reason why people are not here, so if that's the case, I'm not sure you want to put it. But uh, again, it, it, I did not invent any, unfortunately, for me. I just read it in various textbooks, validated it, do the calculations, and then put it on my lecture notes after thinking that's what you need to know. Um, so you can find it in any standard textbook, basically. Um, the idea of helicity, right? Helicity H is defined as the projection of the spin operator along the direction of motion. Why is that important? Because the direction of motion, the way we describe it here, and the spin are completely in the unrelated, right? It says that the motion can be in any direction, x, y, and z, and spin we measure in the z direction or x direction. So we don't want that, right? It makes more sense to look at that. The, the natural direction that we have is the direction of the motion of the particle. So we look at helicity, which is the, the direction of the spin, uh, the projection of the spin on the direction of the motion, right? So this is basically defined as the spin uh, dot p, of course, normalized. And then I said that, um, well, I didn't really have time to say that. Um, helicity is uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, and therefore it, cons it is uh, conserved with time. Helicity commutes with the Hamiltonian of the Dirac particle, therefore it is conserved. Serving time. Uh, it's actually straightforward to see that. Simply write this down as the S matrix is a sigma over 2, then just sigma is made of the poly spin matrices. So if you just write down the poly spin matrices with P, you can see how it commutes with the Hamiltonian and, and get it right away. Uh, uh, huh? The eigenvalues of the helicity, right, since the helicity is spin normalized, the spin always gets a plus minus one half. Eigenvalues of the helicity are also always plus minus one half. So um, one half called the uh, uh, right handed lambda h is plus minus one half. Plus is called the right handed and minus is called the left handed. the uh, city uh, right the problem with the helicity um, is that it is not Lorentz invariant so two different observers will not agree on the helicity and the reason is quite obvious because when we have a massive particle that travels at some velocity it cannot be the speed of light, it has to be lower than the speed of light. So we can always move to a frame in which this uh, particle will be moving in the opposite direction. So let's reverse the sign of the sign of helicity. Uh, we did say that we can find, again, I did not prove it to you because it's just a few minutes and it's really math. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. But I said that we can find um, simultaneous eigenvalues of the helicity uh, and the Hamiltonian. And I denoted them as u up, down, v up and down. U up, we'll write as uh, c, p i phi s, uh, p over e plus m uh, c, and uh, p over e plus m s. 
where C and S are cosine and sine. Theta over 2, and S is the sine of theta over 2. And theta is the angle uh, of the momentum. I just expressed the momentum in um, spherical coordinates. Right? Uh, don't you have uh, E over I sine on the last? I, yes, I do. P was written as P and then sine theta cosinus phi, sine theta sine phi, and cosine um, theta. And the same for U down. Is it minus s e i phi c p over e plus m s and minus p over e plus m e i phi c and similarly for the up and down. All right, so this was a quite quick recap on what we did. Questions? No, that means everything is clear. At the point that I want to say, okay, then let's see that in the exam. There's no exam. I just have to take your word for it. <laughs> My experience tells me that some of you are lying. It's not so clear to all of you. I can be wrong. Uh, okay, so the, there are two more things that I want to do regarding the direct equation before we move on. So I mentioned that the, I wouldn't say a problem, but the drawback of the helicity is that it is not a Lorentz invariant. And the reason is that when we define it, it depends on some external property of the particle, namely the spin is something which is internal to the particle, but the momentum is something which is external, right? This depends on the coordinate that we're choosing. And we choose a different coordinate, we get a different result. But we can make, um, Another quantity, which is only related to the intrinsic properties of the particle, uh, and therefore it is a Lorentz invariant, namely it is conserved under Lorentz transformation. Two different observers will agree on that quantity. And the name of that quantity is called chirality, which is sort of a mirrorness. As it turned out, uh, the property of chirality it's quite important in many branches of physics, not necessarily particle physics. Uh, right? This is a Lorentz invariant quantity. which for, for a massive particle, it is not a constant of motion. So that's the price we pay. <coughs> that is not a constant of motion. So it does not commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, for a massive particle, for massless particle, they're, they're the same. hand or handedness. Yes, exactly. This is the anti-symmetry that we have between our left hand and the right hand. They are the same when you look at the mirror, but they are not really the same, right? There is something. Uh, uh, this is really a, a mirror, mirror, mural asymmetry. Mural asymmetry. Uh, of an object. Uh, so when we say a chiral object, it's an object that its mirror um, image is not identical to it. If you put your right hand in front of the mirror, you'd see the left hand. Right? It's not a parity when you're reversing all of them. 
just a mirror image. You put the mirror and it, it's not the same. Okay? Yeah, question? It, it, yeah. it has something to do with the therapy operator? With the therapy operator? No, it's not the same. No? No. It's not the same. In party, you're reversing all directions. Okay. In Kiranity, you're just having a mirror image. Like you're not reversing all the directions. Think of it for, for a second. Um, that means that you cannot superimpose an object on its mirror image. Yes. Take an object, take a mirror image, take my right hand and mirror image, the left hand. I cannot superimpose them. There is a difference. Right? Um, for example, right? it appears in nature in many places, which some of them you might surprise. You know, like the, in DNA, right? There is this helix. You know, it's always right handed helix. Yeah. It's a good question why. Because you could have, a, you know, biologically speaking, it could, it could be a left handed. But it's not. There is a claim that uh, there might be something. That's actually one of the things that it's, it's the right for all the creatures. Mm -hmm. All the creatures have the same, all the creatures on Earth. Yeah. Right. Maybe we'll find some creatures, you know, that they doesn't seem to be that far. Possibly within our lifetime that there will be life found not in Earth, and nobody knows if the, the DNA there will also be right in the spiral or left in the spiral. It's, it's, it's an interesting question why. Uh, also in crystals, right? Crystallography, it's also uh, it's all the same. You know, the parallel uh, symmetry. Uh, of course, what we care about here is particle physics, so I'm not going to talk about DNAs or crystals, and we'll have to get to other. other uh, Classes. So um, within the standard model, when we speak about curality, we have a, a new matrix which was there in your previous homework if you already did that. That's called the gamma gamma five matrix. It's a new matrix which is defined as multiplication of all the other matrices i times gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Of course, the way this matrix looks like depends on the presentation you want. We use the Dirac Poly representation. Uh, in the homework, I was asking you for to work in a different representation, which is more suitable for that. Uh, so it, by no means, this is the only representation. We discussed it already. In the Dirac Poly representation, the structure of this matrix would be a 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0, 0, or 0, i, i, 0. This is a two by two matrix. And it has some very nice mathematical properties, which of course do not depend on the exact representation that you choose. So some properties. Gamma five squared is always the identity. You can easily prove that. I mean this you are you're asked to prove this at home. Easily prove that by just uh, the properties of the gamma matrices. Uh, gamma 5 dagger is always equal to gamma 5. And it always anti commutes with any of the other uh, four matrices. Gamma 5, gamma mu is a minus gamma mu, gamma 5. So that is to say that they anti commute. And the eigenstates of this gamma 5 matrix are known as the left-handed and right-handed chiral eigenstates. Okay. Eigenstates gamma 5 are called left, left, or right. And that um, Carol Students. and are denoted by U R and U L. Like here we have U up and U down, so we have U R and U L. And of course, they are defined in such a way that gamma 5 of ur is ur plus 
Yeah, I'm a five. Can, can you not write there because you can see? Can I what? I can I can see the board there if you write for them. You cannot see the board. Yeah, there's the. Ah, uh, this is okay. Yes. Thank you. This you cannot see. Yes. So gamma five of U R is plus U R. Gamma five of U L is minus U L. And of course, gamma five of V R is minus V R, and gamma five of V L is a plus V L. Now, if we take the limit. In the limit where E is much greater than M, what is P over E plus M? P over e. What? P over e. Which is? One. One. Thank you. Yeah, this is one. What is this limit, by the way? It's the speed of light. Speed of light, right? So this is a limit of a massless particle. Mm -hmm. right. And in that limit, the chiral eigenstates are the same as the helicity uh, eigenstates. So in this limit, we have that. In this limit, in the limit E of A, chiral eigenstates <coughs> are equal to the helicity eigenstates. So you are is u up, it's actually written on the board, but in this limit we roughly c s e i phi c s e i phi. And similarly u l is a minus s c e i phi s minus c e i phi v r is S minus C E I phi minus S C E I phi. And then VL is C S E I phi C S E I phi. Maybe there is some, yeah, no, that's fine. Which means that. And here you have that U R is equal to V L and U L is equal to minus V R. But they are still representing particles and antiparticles. So that means that you know this is just the internal part of the solution. Right? There is also the spatial and temporal part. It's E plus minus uh, I P mu X mu, right? So these are still different. So don't get confused. These are still the particles and antiparticles and the full wave function, or the full spinors are not the same. Right? The, right. A, a final comment about that is that unlike helicity, there is no simple uh, physical interpretation. For the chirality. Helicity, we can just say right away. It's projection of the spin on the direction of motion. Chirality is some sort of an internal quantity, uh, internal uh, feature of the particle which does not have a simple uh, physical interpretation. Uh, as we said, for massive particle, this is for massless particle essentially, right? This is for massless particles. For massive particle, chirality is not invariant under boost. Sorry, helicity is not, sorry. 
or massive particles. Helicity is not invariant, not low, it's invariant. Uh, but chirality is a Lorentz invariant. So how can they be the same here? If I said one is not Lorentz invariant, one is Lorentz invariant. How can they get the same value? This is true for massless, but in the limit where the, the particle has no mass, then they coincide. It's quite nice. When the particle have mass, they, they are not the same. Uh, uh, and then I said similarly, the helicity, helicity commutes is Hamiltonian. H Dirac, which means that helicity is conserved in time. But the gamma five matrix does not commute with H D. So, duality against states. Or not. Observe. In time. Just that you know. It's quite. Interesting feature which plays some role, but again, it's a short course, I won't have time to discuss everything else. One thing which we do have time to discuss, and again, I think I asked you a little bit, uh, the purity projection operators. Questions about that, or I can erase it? Can I erase? Said that the Dirac spinor can be decomposed into the left and right handed parallel um, components. And we can do that by using the projection operators. So any Dirac spinor can be decomposed into left. components using projection operators the R is one half one plus number five L is one half, one minus gamma five. Okay. Now, using the properties which I have erased of the gamma five matrices, um, it's pretty straightforward to show that these two operators have everything you ask for with projection operators. 
So, easy to check. Right, easy to check, but if you don't think it's easy, then go and check it. Also, if you do think it's easy, go check it. Right? PR plus PL is one. one. PR squared. PR. PR. PL squared. And PR operating on PL. Zero. They do not overlap. Essentially, did you see projection operator in quantum mechanics? No? It's the first time? What? <laughs> no, possibly not. I honestly, I don't remember what was the first time I saw projection operators. Uh, in linear in algebra, in your algebra, maybe? Yes, it is. It's all the same. Uh, which means that essentially every Dirac spinor we can always write as u, every spinor can be written as u is equal a r u r plus a l u l which are some complex coefficients which is simply p r u plus p l so I take the Dirac spinor u so I operate and I just write it as a sum of p r plus pi l which is just unity and I get the ur times some coefficient ar, which is some complex coefficient. Uh, and the ul and ur, of course, the, the left and right hand of dual uh, eigenstates. Uh, we will write those. Is there anybody who did not see Lagrangians? Everybody here, because I think there were a few students and I'm not sure that they saw Lagrangians. Okay, I will write Lagrangians. It may be even today. Uh, so I'm writing Lagrangians. Uh, again, in the Dirac poly representation, Only in that representation, PR is one half one zero one zero zero one zero one. And then again one zero one zero zero one zero one. And PL is one half one zero minus one zero zero one zero minus one minus one zero one zero. Zero minus one, zero one. That's the way they look like. There's another presentation which is called the Cairo presentation, which you're supposed to be doing at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, where they get even simpler, much simpler uh, form. But it doesn't matter because whatever form you get, then you have um, you know, P R U R U R, P R U L is zero. P R U R is U R, P R U L is zero, P R V R is zero, P R V L is V L, and the same for the left. Hello. P R P R is zero. P R V R is zero. Yes. Because V R is minus. Check check it out. The same for the PL, we have PL UR right, zero, PL UL is UL, PL V R is VR, PL VL is Alright. I'm rushing a little bit. I don't think it's set. Set the Questions? No? Okay. 
then I'm going to erase that. And there is one last subject which is quite fun. Again, because this is a subject that um, its importance ex extends way, way above, way more than, than what we do in particle physics to many other branches of physics. Uh, but it's introduced here normally. Uh, can I erase that part? Um, not yet. The, um, the last part. Erase uh, this part. Uh, this part, mm -hmm. I'm still doing the right thing. I haven't done with that yet. And give me one more second. Is there any special reason why this is a house in there? Is there any special yeah, reason in that specific representation? No, no, no. It's a It's a We are L in one half. One plus minus one. Ah, so the just to keep the the normalization. You want to keep that. More? No. Okay. Uh, can I just stop? Okay. Everybody's happy. Uh, the next is called the right field bilinear or bilinear components. So when we spoke about the rock field, we had a current, J U psi or gamma mu psi. Right. And remember we wrote Feynman diagrams, right? And we saw that there are some with each vertex, and we have to take into consideration these currents. And they, they are there. So everything is associated with with each other, so it's not just, uh, so it's not uh, unrelated. So apparently, in the, both in QED and QCD, quantum coronal dynamics, that's a strong force, uh, there are many interactions which involve exchange of these currents. So currents of this type, of this type, exist in many, QED, QCD interactions. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much we'll be able to see right now. We have to take a more advanced course. Um, I I argue that this transforms like a four vector. Right? This is really a four vector. Right? Um, uh, why this is important? Because at the end of the day, this card appears inside the matrix element, right? Which has to be a Lorentz invariant. So I have to, I have, and you know, from this matrix element, we calculate what will be the probability of scattering to a core, or the probability of decay to a core, right? Remember that. So I need to know. Uh, I had to know that. Uh, 
this quantity is Lorentz invariant, is, is a Lorentz vector. This is a form vector. So it turns out that uh, from Dirac spinors uh, and the gamma matrices, we can construct uh, several quantities which transform in certain ways. Right. Scalars, vectors, tensors, and there is also what is known as pseudo vectors and pseudo scalars. There are also pseudo tensors, but I'm not going to discuss them. Right. What is that? Uh, so, from from Iraq spinor and the gamma matrices, one can construct um, uh, several uh, quantities that appear transformation properties. So they all of these look something like psi bar, gamma, psi. So gamma is something like four by four matrix. I said there are five types of interest to us. So the types are the following type. So the first one is a scalar. And the form of the scalar what is a scalar that I can make? Psi bar. Psi bar psi, that's right. How many components does a scalar have? One. What is the Lorentz transformation of a scalar? What? The scalar is S under Lorentz transformation. S. S. It does not change. What happens under parity? To a scalar? To a scalar, yeah. Not to the coordinates. To a scalar, it does not change. The next thing we mentioned is the vector. So the form of a vector, I already wrote it there, is psi bar, gamma mu psi. How many components does a vector have? Four. Four. What is the Lorentz transformation of a vector? You have the one, gamma, right? So v mu, we go to lambda mu yeah. nu, v nu. What happens to the vector under parity? Only the only the spatial part, right? So V would go to um, V0 and minus Vj. The third one is a tensor. Examples of a tensor? Well, first, the form of a tensor, psi bar. It will be a gamma mu, gamma nu, minus gamma nu, gamma mu, psi. How many components does it have? Can anybody see from here? Six. Six. Why six? Anti-symmetry. Anti-symmetry. Because of the anti-symmetry here. 
What happens under Lorentz transformation? We're supposed to practice at home. Each component transforms separately. Yes. So that's we have a lambda mu of the rot here rho, lambda mu sigma t rho c. Forget about the parity. The next one is called a pseudo vector, an axial vector. So, and if you want to guess what would be the form of an axial vector in Dirac, bilinear. Psi bar, gamma mu, gamma five, psi. How many components does the pseudo vector have? Four. What happens to the pseudo vector under Lorentz transformation? The same. The same as a regular vector. So a mu goes to lambda mu nu a mu. What happens to the pseudo vector under parity? Minus one. Right. So the time component gets a minus one, the space component does not change. So A goes to minus A zero and A J. Can I give you an example of pseudo vectors uh, that you're familiar with? The magnetic field. Magnetic field. It's not, it's not a real vector, it's a yes. pseudo vector. Yeah. Also, angular momentum. It's a pseudo vector. Think of that for a second. Uh, torque is also a pseudo vector. Think of it under part. It, when you try to do computations with magnetic fields, for example, and you use spherical coordinates, you realize that it's not a real vector when you get to yeah. the poles. Try that. We tried it once, and you see that, that you can, some, something messy gets there. So the magnetic field as opposed to electric field, which is a vector, magnetic field is a pseudo vector. And the fifth one? Pseudo scale. Pseudo scale, right. Pseudo. Anybody want to guess how it looks like? Psi bar becomes five. Yeah. Psi bar, yeah, five. Psi. psi. How many components? One. One. What happens to a pseudo scalar under uh, Lorentz transformation? Nothing. Nothing, right? It remains the same. What happens to pseudo scalar under parity? Minus. Get the minus sign. Any examples for pseudo scalars in the uh, might of know of? Um, the, the spherical, uh, we saw it in the homework. I don't think so. Uh, pseudo scalars. We saw uh, something that with, with the scalar and gets negative parity. Uh, if you saw that, then this is a pseudo scalar, yes. Uh, helicity is a pseudo scalar. And uh, another thing is, is um, uh, uh, magnetic charge. So there, there are no magnetic monopoles, but some theories do predict the existence of magnetic monopoles. Right? So if there are magnetic monopoles in some of these quantum field theories, which again, we don't have any evidence for their existence in nature, right? Then there would be a pseudo scalars. Like also a magnetic flux, by the way. Magnetic flux is a pseudo scale. Okay. Uh, so the difference between real scalar and pseudo scalar is the same as the difference between real vectors and axial vectors. You don't see that in the Lorentz transformation, they transform the same. You do see that when you apply the parity transformation. Yeah. Uh, it is a vector or is a pseudo vector? Check it out. Is there any 
Yes, we send them out with the spherical harmonics uh, are occasionally epsilon vectors when L is a node number. Could be. Okay, they are more than you think, right? If you just look at Lorentz transformations, then you don't you don't really see that. If you start playing with parity, then you start realizing that not everything you have is still assume the same way. Uh, uh, what did I want to say? Okay, so let's say I'm willing to spend 15 minutes to give you some proof of some proofs of that, uh, and then we'll just move on. So proofs. Uh, Right. So, you know, the first thing is to show is that if we take an axial vector, we can Lorentz transform it and then act on it with a parity, or act with a parity and then Lorentz transform it and we'll get the same result. Right, so let's show that. Consider an axial vector. A axial vector. I just take the time and x components. Right? Uh, claim boost plus p is equal to p plus boost. So the order doesn't change, doesn't matter. So a is the axial vector, the time and x component, I'm going to write as uh, a0 and a1. This is the time and x. I forget about the y and z, because I don't, uh, I don't care about that. So if I do a Lorentz boost and then parity, that means I take a0, a1, then I do Lorentz boost, which is gamma minus gamma beta minus gamma beta gamma. And then parity of a zero a one. So this is parity times gamma times a zero minus beta a one, and then minus beta a zero plus a one. And what does the parity do? For an axial vector, it takes a to minus a. Uh, a1 is not attached, but beta is the space, so it is being reversed. So I have gamma times minus a0 plus beta a1, and here I have a minus beta a0, because both of these switch sign, right? The under parity, p beta gives me minus beta, right? And p a0 gives me minus a0. Uh, minus beta a0 uh, plus a1. So what happens when I apply first the Lorentz boost and then the parity? If I go the other way around, if I, I apply first the parity and then the Lorentz boost, then a0 a1 is uh, but now I have to remember, since I apply the parity, the Lorentz boost will be in the opposite direction. So it will be a gamma plus gamma beta plus gamma beta gamma on uh, minus a0, a1. This again is a gamma minus a0 plus beta a1 and a minus beta a0 plus a1. So this is the same as that which proves what I claimed. Why are the matrices different? 
the, because when I applied parity, I switched the order of the, the Lorentz transformation. So now x gets into minus x. So beta is minus beta. Now, let's say in the next few minutes, let's look at the transformation properties of these Dirac um, bilinears and show you that they indeed transform like that, right? So let's, it's okay, everybody is clear what I'm doing here? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I need to do all of them. Just give you, because it's, it's quite technical, so I'll do like one or two and then the rest you will, you will feel at home. Yeah. Well, although we're already halfway Okay, so let's look at the how does the Lorentz boost of uh, the Dirac bilinear look like. So let's let's do like an example. I don't know if we need to look at all of these. Psi bar psi. So what do we have under Lorentz transformation? have the psi goes to s psi, right? Psi bar, psi dagger, gamma zero. So it will go to psi dagger, s dagger, gamma zero. Right? S here is a boost, along the, remember we had that s, uh, we derived it on the board a while ago. We go back to where I derived it. Wrote it down if you remember a uh, boost along the z direction. It's not a boost, right? This is the S matrix of the sun, of the spinal. Right? So you wrote it down S equal to AI minus V gamma zero gamma three. A was equal square root of one half gamma plus one. V was equal to square root of one half gamma minus one. Remember we did this derivation? Mm -hmm. This is the Lorentz, this is the matrix that multiplies psi under Lorentz transformation in the z direction. Okay. Remember we, we derived that uh, two lectures, two classes in or something like that. Okay. Uh, so what do we have? On the Lorentz transformation, we have the psi bar psi to transform as psi dagger, s dagger, gamma zero, s psi. Now, let's write this explicitly. s dagger, gamma zero, s is a i minus b gamma three dagger, gamma zero dagger. Gamma zero, AI minus B, gamma zero, gamma three. And what is gamma zero dagger? Gamma zero. What is gamma three dagger? Minus. So minus gamma three here. So we can write this as AI plus B, gamma three, gamma zero. Gamma zero AI minus B gamma zero gamma three. And then I can simply put gamma zero on the le on the to the left here. To right A I gamma zero plus B 
gamma 3. What is gamma 0 squared? I. 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 So times AI minus B gamma 0, gamma 3. So we have here A squared gamma 0. Now, gamma 0, gamma 3, okay, let's just write it down, minus b squared, gamma 3, gamma 0, gamma 3. Now, these two terms, a, i, gamma 0, b, gamma 0, gamma 3, so minus plus b gamma 3 a i, they will simply cancel out. And then I just reverse this order. So I get an extra minus sign. So gamma 3 gamma 0 is a minus gamma 0 gamma 3. And gamma 3 squared is a minus i. which means that we have here gamma zero, a squared minus b squared. So we just plug in these two. So this is just gamma zero, one half gamma plus one, minus one half gamma minus one, which is just gamma zero. So S dagger gamma zero S is just gamma zero, which is essentially, I can replace that with a gamma zero, and that means that this is equal to psi dagger gamma zero psi or psi bar psi, which completes the proof that what we have here is a, is a Lorentz scale out. What happens under parity? Psi right. bar psi goes to psi dagger d dagger gamma zero d psi. That's okay. What is p? Gamma zero. Gamma zero, right? So, uh, P is equal to gamma zero. So P dagger gamma zero P is just gamma zero dagger. Gamma zero, gamma zero. What is gamma zero dagger? Gamma zero. Gamma zero. So gamma zero, gamma zero, gamma zero, which is? Gamma zero. Gamma zero. What did we get? The same. The same. So this is psi dagger. So gamma zero psi, which is psi bar. So p of psi bar psi is just psi bar Then we can play the same game with the other ones here. And I think I'll skip that um, to save time. It is in my lecture notes, so you can read it. The math is exactly the same as much and just using this, this uh, properties of the matrices. I do urge you to go and do that just for you to get the feeling of working with these matrices. To see that. Yes. We saw that the parity operator is equivalent to gamma zero in the case of the direct spanner, but what about the conjugate of the direct spanner, the psi bar? What about it? How do we know that the parity operator um, 
Side bar is a uh, is psi dagger gamma zero, right? Yeah. So gamma zero is just a matrix. I don't care about it. And psi dagger I operate on p p dagger. Okay. Right. And p dagger is just gamma zero dagger, which is gamma zero. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't want to work it out now in class, just to save a little bit of time, but um, I do urge you to actually dirt your hands. I mean, some things you best learn after you dirt your hands. Okay? okay. Yes? Lemala, we found that Psy is שפסאי דגר כפול פאי, תחת הטרנספורמציה, פיתחת את זה, או אפילו אתה שזה שווה שזה הופך לפסאי דגר כפול גמא אפס כפול פסאי, ואז הראתה שזה שווה לפסאי דואר כפול פסאי. למה זה שווה? that psi, the psi bar psi is a scalar. And I said that scalar has two properties. One is that it, under Lorentz transformation, it transforms like a scalar. And two, that under parity, it is not changed. This is the defining properties of a scalar. Okay? okay? And I just proved these two properties. I just said, okay, I know how psi changes when I make a Lorentz transformation. Remember, the psi is an internal degrees of, degree of freedom, right? So when I make a Lorentz transformation, this internally also changes. This is not the external degree. This is not the momentum of the particle or the location of the particle. This is an internal degree of freedom, but it also changes according to this matrix S, which was derived here. We derived it like two, two or three lectures ago. I, I don't remember at the moment. And using that, uh, using that, I calculated well, how how would psi bar how would psi bar psi transform under when I make a Lorentz transformation, right? So psi bar is psi dagger gamma zero. So it would transform as psi dagger s dagger gamma zero. Psi would transform as s psi. So psi bar psi would transform as psi dagger s dagger gamma zero s psi. And I showed, I proved by looking at this. Three matrices, basically multiplying these three matrices, that these three matrices are equal to gamma zero. And so I can write this as psi bar, psi dagger, gamma zero psi, which is nothing but psi bar psi. Namely, I just show that under Lorentz transformation, the psi bar psi is the same. The second no, final I... property was under parity. I took parity and I asked what happens under parity. Uh, psi bar psi, and I showed again that under when I make a parity transformation, psi bar psi does not change. That's all. I only understand the mirror of the one that psi dagger equal gamma fs equal psi, and psi bar equal psi. Why is gamma fs there? What? This is the definition of psi of psi bar. Right. Remember that uh, if you go back uh, a few lectures ago, this is how we define psi bar. Psi bar was defined, if you want, as psi dagger gamma zero. Okay. Okay. If you want, we can do the same for, for the uh, pseudo scalar, right? Psi bar gamma five psi. If you take the pseudo scalar, let's do it just once. It'll take two minutes. Psi. So pseudo scalar. Psi bar gamma five psi. All right, so the Lorentz transformation, we get an S dagger gamma zero gamma five S. Which, after you open up, I'm not going to expand it, you're going to get with a minus gamma five gamma zero, which is gamma zero gamma five. Just expand it here. I'm not going to do the math now. And under parity, we have p dagger gamma zero uh, gamma five p. 
is gamma zero squared because p dagger is gamma zero dagger, which is gamma zero times gamma five gamma zero. So this is gamma five gamma zero, which is minus gamma zero gamma five. So on the parity, we get an extra minus sign. Okay, now I suggest we take a 10 minute break and we meet back here at 5.30 because I want to switch subject. Uh, again, in my lecture notes you can find uh, the mathematical derivatives for the pseudo, for the vectors and the pseudo vectors, go over them. Mathematically it's the same, it's just multiplying matrices, that's all. Once you get this, it's nothing but algebra, just the same algebra we did here, and it's uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's take a 10 minutes break and meet here at uh, 5.30.
מתכוון, אני אקח את הפסאי הזה, את הספינור הזה, ואני ארשום אותו בצורה של אופרטור. לוקחים את הוואקום, שכל אחד כזה, כל אופרטור כזה לוקח מצב וואקום, ומרים אותו למעלה. או הורג פוזיטרון. בדיוק, מרים למעלה, ברגע שיש לי מצב מעורר של וואקום, אני קורא לזה חלקי. ואז לחלקי כזה, יש את אותן תכונות של הערך, של הוקטור העצמי הזה של פסאי. הרמתי אותו, הספינור U1, קיבלתי אלקטרון עם ספין חצי, הרמתי אותו עם ספינור עם שתיים, קיבלתי אלקטרון עם ספין עם שתיים. זה משהו שבאמת, אני לא אמרתי לך את זה שבוע שעבר, אבל שאלתי שאלה מאוד חכמה. המיקסינג הזה הוא בא לידי ביטוי. כן, על זה היום. כל אחד מהמיקסינג, בעצם, זה לא רק אופרטור על האחד, צריך פה, לכל אחד מה... ספינורים, יש שם קומבינציה של אופרטור אחד של או של העלאה של חלקיק והורדה של אנטי חלקיק או ההפך, של העלאה של אנטי חלקיק והורדה של חלקיק, אין ביניהם קאפלים, אבל אתה לא יכול לראות את זה. כל הפתרונות שהראית כאן הם מצבים עצמאיים של טנאפ, לא דאגנו לנרמות בכלל, לא אכפת לי בכלל, כל זה כאילו לא סופר, מה? אגב, אנחנו כן נראה את זה, היא הפיך, 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 פלוס אם כן, זה אני חושב שזה די מאוד. אה, יש לך נרמול כללי. זה פונקציה של פליימוי. יש לך נרמול כללי. 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 יש לך פה, החלקיק הזה הוא חופשי, אתה נמצא באיזשהו מקום, באיזשהו מובן, מה שיש לך זה נרמול של הפרוביליטי, נרמול של רו, אנחנו ראינו, רו זה פסאי אחד בריבוע, ועוד פסאי שתיים בריבוע, ועוד פסאי שלוש בריבוע, ועוד פסאי ארבע, זה צריך שווה לך. אם אני מודד לדוגמא את המיקום של רו, אז לרגע יש לי דלתא פאנקשן בנקודה. ברגע שעשית את זה, זה היה שקרסה, עכשיו אתה נמצא בתוך... זה עדיין מצב שאני צריך לתאר אותו, זה שקור יהיה כלשהו על ה... יש לי פה E בפסקת I זה, כפול U1, כפול אני שם פה איזשהו נרמול. הנרמול פחות מעניין אותי, חשוב לי שתבין את הסרון הבסיסי. עכשיו אתה צודק שאתה אומר, אוקיי, אין דבר כזה, פה אותו בעיה שיש לך עם... אין דבר כזה כזה עם שמור משהו שם. אתה יכול לשם חלקיק ליצור פה פוטנציאל. זה נכון, אני מסתכל פה חלקיק חופשי שלכאורה אין דבר כזה בקשר סתם פוטנציאל. זה תיאורטי בשביל להיעזר בו. יש קשר בין הקובע וקטורים האלה לבין הקונטרה וקטור וקובע וקטור מעבר. אין שום קשר? אין כאילו, אם אני אעשה עכשיו את הקובע. מה שמגדיר אותם, מה שמגדיר וקטור. קודם כל, כל דבר שאני אומר וקטור זה ארבע וקטורים. שזה הקונטרה וקטור שדיברנו עליו, או שזה גם וגם אני... זה הקונטרה וקטור שדיברנו. תמיד אני שם, תמיד אני שם... אני אומר, מפה לדוגמה אני יכול לקחת את האקסיה על וקטור ולהגדיר לו אקסיה על קו-וקטור? כן, אבל אין לך שום סיבה לעשות את זה. אתה יכול לעשות את זה, הם לא חיים באותו מרחב. זה מרחב אחר לגמרי. אין שום סיבה לעשות את זה. וקטורים חיים של רפל וקטורים, מה שמגדיר את ההבדל בין וקטור ואקסטור וקטור זה מה קורה כשאתה עושה פעם. ‫הוא מסד יפה כל שעה. ‫-כן, כן, כן. 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 ‫-
almost half of the stuff we which he gave in his talk. Well, that's much machine holding. Yeah, Okay, can we move on? What I'm going to do now, are there more people it's possible? What about the... Okay, what I'm going to do now is basically consider a tutorial symmetry uh, flavor and the CKM matrix but I have an idea what the CKM First thing first, uh, is a spin, it's not a spin, the name is very close to spin, but it's not a spin. It's a symmetry which is related to the strong interaction. What is a spin? Is a symmetry related 
to the strong interaction. Uh, and basically that is there to explain why individual quarks are grouped into baryons and mesons and not others. Uh, from a historical perspective, it started off by people noticing that the protons and the neutrons are nearly identical particles. If you remove the charge, you're saying that they basically are nearly identical, they have the same masses, right? Uh, MP or MN, uh, MP minus MN over MP is less than 0.51%. Uh, have the same binding energy, um, and that they're nearly identical. Um, which means that, you know, potentially the strong force is the same for both of them. Um, of course, they don't have the same charge, but they can still be viewed as two representations of uh, two aspects of the same symmetry group, in a way. Um, now, of course, the P and the N are not the same, right? They are discriminated by both electromagnetic interaction and uh, weak interaction because neutron can decay yeah. into proton. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, from the strong interaction point of view, they are nearly indistinguishable. From strong interaction, interaction, they are nearly In this thing, we shovel. In this thing, we shovel. Of course, this is just an approximate symmetry. It's not an exact symmetry, but it's approximately good enough because they don't have the same mass. The same mass. Now, the symmetry group that describes this degeneracy is. Symmetry. What? Symmetry. I don't know. Symmetry group. It's nearly much like the spin, so this would be an SU2. So the symmetry group SU2 special unitary two dimension, uh, which is the same symmetry group that describes the spin. So that's why. The name is isospin. Same as or spin. Therefore, the name isospin. But again, isospin has got nothing to do with the spin. Isospin is a completely different symmetry than, than spin. Uh, so very very much like regular spin, so everything we did on regular spin, we can basically take a carbon copy to isospin. Uh, so that means that the isospin is described by two numbers. Isospin is described by two numbers. I, right, which is the total isospin. And I3 is a component of the isospin in a given direction. Right, so the state we'll say is I I3. In a given direction in space or is it just some sort of abstract direction. It is an abstract direction in a sense, same like a spin, basically. I mean, oh, well, it's not abstract. You choose, yeah. It's a, I guess, uh, yeah, it's, it's identical to spin. So yeah, so you just select the direction, which can be Z. I didn't want to say Z because it can be anything. I and I3. So, you know, in this picture that we have, both the proton and the, and the neutron Right, the same as we're speaking about electron, we spin up and spin down. We still call it an electron. 
right? Just one, we don't say that electron spin up is not the same particle as electron spin down, right? So the same way here, we said that the proton and the neutron, we don't call them two distinguished particles. We call them two states of one particle, which we call the nucleon, right? So in this picture, the proton and neutrons, uh, are two states, or two states of a particle which we call nucleon, of a nucleon. And of course, that's an isospin doublet, so we assign to it i equal one half. We say that the proton, of course, will have one half and one half, and the neutrons would be one half and minus one. Half. So far, so good. Again, it's not the same, but mathematically, the structure is exactly the same structure as that of the uh, spin. Now, of course, we know today that this is. Not true, because protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. Right? So we can simply take that um, and uh, in analogy convert it into quarks. Right? So the proton is a UUD and the neutron is a UDD, up and down quarks. So uh, we can define the U and D state in the same way that we define the proton and the uh, and the uh, neutron, uh, but now of course we have the advantage because from the up and down states we also uh, construct other particles such as the mesons. So we can say, so we can extend uh, and define the up quark states this would be the half half. So we can simply call this a one zero, as we have for um, spins. And the down quark state is a half and minus half. So we just call that zero one state. Just notice that we, you know, we're referring to the same particles, you know, just have different names, right? So when I say up state, I mean isospin, total isospin half, and isospin in a certain direction. If you want z to be z, I prefer to just look at it as a random one. So half, and I can also write it as a one zero. Yes. Can I say about up to down? Uh, I'm not sure if that's the origin of these names. It's just a definition, so it doesn't matter. So we see that the up quark has the same value as the B, B uh, particle? So yeah, the particle? The two are the same. So the difference between the proton and the neutron are just the up and down quark. Again, historically, this started by describing the proton and the neutron. Quarks were only discovered in the later on in the 60s. This goes back to, I don't know when, 50s, 40s, even. At the, I, I don't know when exactly. Okay. Uh, so, if now we said that the up and down quark could not be distinguishable, so they're indistinguishable, that means that uh, any QCD interaction uh, we can express as um, uh, well, an invariance under uh, general uni unitary transformation. Let's write it down. Uh, if up, down, quark uh, states are indistinguishable in this in shovel 
um, labor independence of UCD uh, interaction uh, is expressed as uh, variance under the non is expressed is expressed as an invariant as an invari invariance under a general unitary transformation. Namely, the state with an up prime and down prime, down prime is just some unitary transformation on the state of an up and down. And U is a unitary two by two unitary matrix. It is a unitary matrix. Versus the emitted quantity. Right, so U, U, dagger is equal to 1. Which means we can always write it as U, this is F of alpha, which is the rotation parameter basically, is E minus I over 2 alpha dot sigma. What is sigma? Pauli matrices. Again, we have the same mathematical structure as the spin. Right. So this is what we have here. This is rotation in isosphere space. Uh, uh, written in isospin space are written in terms of Pauli matrices. So, yeah. What is the meaning of U prime and D prime? Well, again, this is a new state, right? I took the up and down state, I rotate it. Aren't up and down quirks? What? Aren't up and down quirks? Yeah, up and down so, are the quarks. So there's only one up. There's only one type of up quirk. Right, hold on, hold on a second. So give you an example. Let's say uh, I'm arguing that a rotation by angle pi around the y-axis transforms a u-state into a d-state. Example. Rotation by angle pi around the y-axis. Transforms U into a D and vice versa. Because U by Y U since I wrote that U, this is just cosine phi over two minus I sine phi over two. Sigma y u. So this is a minus i. Did I miss you something? No. I have a zero minus i i zero of the one zero. And that's a zero one. Which is just a down state. And similarly, u by y of the down state <coughs> is a 
minus i, 0 minus i by 0 of 0, 1 is a minus 1, 0. So this is a minus map state. So basically, rotation in pi around the y axis in the isospin space replaces i3 and adds a factor of minus 1 to the power i minus 1. Uh, now, okay, is that clear? No. Yeah, no. Why, what is pi y, what is pi y times the sigma uh, vector? Pi y is rotation by pi around the y-axis. Yes. So I put here pi around the y-axis, so it's a pi y. And so sigma is the polymatrix, so it's sigma y. Yes. Okay? So it's just e minus i over 2 pi sigma y. Which e to the i something is a cosinus minus i sinus times sigma y. How did the sigma y get down? How did it. Uh... It was always down. I just want a, a dot the. Uh, Isn't it in the exponent? It is the exponent. Yes. Here it's not inside of the sine and the cosine. How did it get out of the sine and cosine? It multiplied plus of them. Plus and pi over 2 times sigma y, and minus i sine pi over 2 times sigma y. What? Euler right? formula. E to the i yeah, it's something, it's cosine something I plus i sine something. The something is that times sigma y. Uh, and you have to think of it by yourself. This is Euler's formula, nothing more than that. Asaf. Yeah. I said, since these are two, um, again, it's not, it, it, it's not a different particle. Right? It's the same particle with different um, quantum numbers. That's the whole point of this symmetry. I'm viewing the up and down quarks, or the proton and neutron, as two manifestations of the same particle. Okay, that's the whole idea of this isospin symmetry. That's the whole idea of symmetry in general in particle physics. Right? The, the two particles are really the same particle, just shown in a different way. Okay, and uh, can you explain the, uh, the first paragraph? What? If you d quark states are indistinguishable, then the flavor independent of QCD interaction, uh, which is what it is, I said that you can distinguish them, but by the charge, obviously they don't have the same charge. So and they don't and uh, the weak interactions also distinguish them, right? Because neutron can decay into proton, but not vice versa. But in, in QCD, then you cannot or you hardly can distinguish them. You can slightly because they have different masses. But, uh, that means that I can express that the fact that they are indistinguishable as an invariance under general unitary transformation. So. Which is another word of saying uh, I'm treating them as uh, different manifestations of the same particle. The same, for me, this, the way I think of it, again, you have an electron with spin up, electron with spin down. It's the same electron, just with a different property of spin. One is in up state, one is in down state. So if you think of it like that, then the up and down quark are the same quark, just with different manifestation. Yes. Uh, symmetry of size of uh, conservation. Here it will be the flavor conserved. Here it will be no, it will be the flavor. Uh, it will be the particle, right? The, the, the particle that we're speaking of, right? The, if it's a proton and neutron, it will be a nucleon. Okay. We'll still stay with the nucleon. Up and down, I don't know how to call it. Um, not exactly a flavor because I'm going to show you that we can extend that to 
Let's look at mesons. Right? Mesons are made of quark and anti quark. Uh, what should I erase? Uh, so, um, maybe I will erase that. So mesons are made of quark, anti-quark pairs. So to describe mesons, we need to first describe uh, or define isospin doublet for anti-quark. So, uh, Need define iso spin. Let's call it doublet for anti quarks. Uh, eventually, we want to combine the doublets and the anti doublets uh, to construct some observed set. The mesons, the baryons, and to do that, we, we will have to use the Klebs Jordan coefficients as we did previously. Uh, but before we can even do that, we have to ensure that the anti quarks transform in the same way as the quarks. We need to ensure that the anti quarks. Transform in the same way as the quarks. So, the definition of the anti doublets would be the following. Down we get half and half would be a minus one zero, and the anti up, which is half and a minus half, is a zero one. And if we define them like that. Then we get that the transformation of the anti quarks matches exactly that of the quarks. So, this is the definition. This is how we define the, the states of the anti quarks. And when we do that, if we do, for example, what we just did, u pi on u of pi. Uh, rotation in pi around the y axis, let's say of the anti down, this will give us a minus i, 0 minus i, i 0 on the down state, which is a minus 1, 0. This is a 0 minus 1, which is a minus up down, anti up. And u rotation of pi angle around y of the anti up is a minus i of the zero one. And this is a minus one zero, which is an anti down. And that means that the doublet that we had. Q bar, 
через the Q bar, which is a minus anti down and anti up, transforms like exactly like the doublet up down, which is what we wanted. means that the logic is clear to everybody what I'm doing here? Yeah. So this is this is basically a definition, right, of the anti-quark states. And I want to use this definition such that when I make a transformation or rotation, they rotate in the same way as the as the quarks. <coughs> it's called the quark doublet. Okay? And that's what I get. It means that what I assign, the I3 that I assign, um, uh, makes sense. So if I assign I3 uh, for the up quark was half, I3 for the down quark was a minus half, I3 for the anti up quark. What is that? What is that? Minus half. And I3 for the anti down quark is a plus. That's what I assign to that. Yes. What happens to the total ESO spin when I add a, a doublet of quarks and anti quarks? What? No. Can have those. So when uh, adding. Adding a doublet and anti doublet can result in either I total is equal one or I total equal to zero. example. This of course is what's going to describe what we made of a um, combination of up and down quarks and anti-quarks. The pi mesons. The pi mesons and also the eta. So that means Can I erase that part? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So, i is equal to one, right? So, what states do we have? We have a state of a one one. What is the state of a one one? It will be a minus up, anti down. Minus. How do we call that? This is a positive prime. Then we have a state of a one, a one zero. That's a what? That was a minus. Because the anti down there is a minus one. If you remember, we said that the up. Uh, well, so the one zero, the down was a zero one, and then we had an anti down was a minus one zero, and an anti up was a zero one. Okay. So a one zero would be a linear combination, so it would be a one over square root of two of up anti up minus down anti down so this is going to be the pi zero 
and at one minus one, which is down anti up, this is going to be called a phi negative phi. And for the i equal to zero states, well, the only option is a zero zero, which is a one over square root of two of up anti up plus down anti down. And we call that the eta particle. And because of this extra, you ask about this extra minus sign here, and the anti down. Um, that exactly why this is anti symmetric and this is symmetric. <coughs> so the triplet here is anti symmetric, this is symmetric. Uh, with respect to the particle exchange, right? this is <coughs> yeah. Huh? Can you see uh, people from home? Can you see me? Can you hear me? I cannot hear you. It says it's recording. The live stream to YouTube is ending. No, no, I asked them to extend it until 7, so it should continue to, if they did it, they said they will do it, they don't know what they're going to do. If they did it, then they should stay there. Uh, yeah, I mean, note that this is opposite for what you get from the spin case, because of this extra minus sign. So there is a difference. Uh, now, questions? Except for technicals, which I don't really know how to solve. Yes? How did it all start? I mean, there must be some experimental motivation for that. I told you what it is. That people looked at protons and neutrons, yeah. and they say that except from the charge, which is obviously different, they're nearly identical in any other way. And that wasn't the nucleon. They both have the same mass. But this, does this express itself in, 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 a, in, in some sort of experimental result? Yes, of course. So I'm going to show you. Just wait uh -huh. another 10, 15 minutes. You want to see. I would not bother telling you that uh, otherwise. Um, can I erase this part now? Yeah. Somehow you don't look that happy. I'm not sure why. Uh, right. For quarks that are not up and down, we're going to assign i equal to zero. Quarks rather than up and down, i is equal to zero by assignment. Uh, uh, now we can use this isospin for hadrons. Isospin is used for hadrons. For example, right, the uh, Kaon K plus is U S anti S. What is the isospin? What? What's the isospin of the Kaon? Half. Half. 
you in half, and that's a zero. For the B minus one. Playing again. U is. U is half, S is zero. For the B, this is a B anti S. What's the other spin? Zero. 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 I is equal to zero. For the lambda particle, it's U B S. What is the other spin? Zero. 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 For the delta plus plus, which is a u u u, excited state. What's the other spin? Yeah. Yeah. Three. So didn't you just say that i is equal to one or i is equal to zero? For the case of uh, up and down, yes. In principle, this could be uh, a one. For this one, it happens to be a zero. You have a different name. It's one. Uh, now, the point is that I and I3 are always conserved in strong interactions. I and I3 are conserved in strong interactions. Uh, I3 is conserved in electromagnetic interactions. This basically answers your question. This is going to show how we're going to use this uh, to check the probability of a certain process to occur. Okay. You're asking about the experimental data. Uh, yeah, I put one more comment. There is another symmetry which is called weak eyes of spin. I'm not going to describe it here, uh, but you might encounter that in the literature if you go and read the textbooks, which I, of course, highly encourage you to do. Um, it's got nothing to do with it. So, if we got this idea, now let's go and see what we can do with that. So example. Question one. Use eyes of spin properties to evaluate uh, the scattering rates of P, P bar goes to pi on plus pi. We solve that. So, any idea how to start? Any idea how to start? You know? Can you write it as quarks? What? Can you write it as quarks? I can, but I don't. I don't need to. First, we have charge. So, what kind of pions we can get from here? <coughs> no. We can have pi on zero plus pi on zero. Is that the only thing we can have? Plus minus. Plus minus, right? So, we can also have p plus p bar goes to pi on plus plus pi on minus. Right. Now, let's look at the isospin representation. So, isospin representation of the protons is a half half. Anti proton is a half minus. 
for the pi on plus. I just wrote it and erased it. Right? This will be a 1, 1. Pi on minus will be a 1, minus 1. And the pi on 0? Pi on 0 is a 1, 0. So for the initial state, initial state, it's a proton, anti-proton. So this is half, half, half minus half. <coughs> so you've seen addition of angular momentum. It was one we did not see. Okay, so this is a what? This is a one over square root of two. One zero plus one over square root of two. Uh, zero zero. This is for the initial state. Yeah? yeah. You agree I'm not cheating. For the final state. There are two final states. So for the pi on plus, pi on minus, we have a 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So again, using the Klebs Jordan coefficient, this will give 1 over square root of 6, 2, 0, plus 1 over square root of 2, 1, 0, plus 1 over square root of 3, 0, 0. For the Pi on zero, pi on zero. This is a one zero. One zero. So again, this is square root of two thirds, two zero, minus one over square root of one third, zero zero. This I'm not going to prove. This is just you go for the Klebs Georgian table and you just read it from there. Yeah? Uh, okay. So, everything starts to make sense now. Now, let's say that we have an interaction. So, we start with uh, initial state, and then there is some interaction. And then there is a final state. Right? So I'm going to denote the interaction operator by O. Interaction operator. <coughs> o. Right. And remember that the scattering amplitude. Why am I going to write the scattering amplitude? Now, what do we know about the isospin eigenstates that they are? Orthogonal, right? Isospin eigenstates. <coughs> or orthogonal. To each other. And if the interaction conserves the isospin, then we have O isospin. O I three, so they commute. So the M plus minus three squared. So it's a five plus pi minus O P P bar. So we only take states which share uh, the same. Uh, uh, final initial states. So we have. What is the zero zero? No, we have a one zero and one zero and zero zero. So we have a one half. Ah, sorry, I looked at the. Program. So we have a one half. One zero. Zero zero. Oh, one zero. Yes. Yes. 
plus one six plus one six zero zero oh zero zero. Wasn't it one of the square roots? Uh, yeah, well, I squared it. Think, yeah, one over sure. Did I do wrong? Check it out. Uh, so, yeah, of course. So, so I'm simply going to write it as one half. Let's call this A1. And let's call this A0. So it's half A1 plus 1 over square root of 6, A0. Yeah. Well, this quickly go, go over um, everything that you've written on the board, something that? What? Can you please quickly go over um, the things what? that you wrote? Um, I was just uh, messing with the Zoom to try to help the uh, folks who couldn't come to Why they're not here? They should be here. Well, we see. I think one of them is in the left. So we said, right? We're looking at the rate. We're giving an example, right? We're looking at the rate of um, of uh, scattering process. P, not scattering, right? right? The scattering. P plus an proton, anti-proton goes into two pions. Two options are pion zero plus pion zero, pion plus one plus pi minus. So we just look at the isospin eigenstates. Proton is half half, anti-proton half minus half, pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero. And so we just have the initial state, which is a combination of the proton anti-proton final state. We have two options, pi plus, pi minus, or pi zero, pi zero. And then we just look at the amplitude matrix, M to get a plus minus, M to get a zero, zero, of course, would be a pi on zero, pi on zero, scattering amplitude, p anti, sorry, uh, scattering operator, p anti p. This is minus one over square root of six, zero, 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 zero. So we just said minus one over square root of six, a zero. So we have the same scattering amplitude, although this is different particles basically. And we said that the cross section is proportional to m squared. So the ratio is sigma of p plus anti p goes to pi and zero plus pi and zero divided by sigma p plus anti p goes to pi and plus plus pi and minus. It's just m zero zero squared divided by m plus minus squared. So this is one six a zero squared divided by one half a one plus a one over square root of six a zero. Square. We should be absolute values. One final comment about that is that when we have interaction, this can take place via some uh, intermediate state, which you call a resonance state. You see that in your homework, interaction can occur via intermediate resonance state. So if we have I equal to zero resonance, that means that A zero is much greater than A one. That means that the ratio is about 1. If we have i equal 1 resonance, then the ratio <coughs> is about 0. We'll never get a pi 0, pi 0. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now, more questions about that.
Why do you say that if this is the I0, then the A is much closer than A1? A0 is closer? Because they will not go directly to pi 0, pi 0, but they will go through some... You can split this operator, so you can have this like an O1, and then there will be some intermediate state, and then another O2, and then P1, right? Mm -hmm. So this intermediate state here might have uh, just an I0, so it would simply this will be removed, so you'll never get it. That's all. Or, or just have a, a one, so everything which is zero will not be there. Yeah. Uh, okay, something related. We will not have time to speak about it this semester, which is very sad, so let's say a few words about that now. Uh, it's called flavor change in weak interactions. We have the W plus minus, they carry charge, so they change the flavor. Weak interactions. Well, charge, weak interactions. Carry by W boson plus minus, they change the flavor. You don't have that with the Z boson, but with the W you do have. Now, when, a when there is a vertex that connects a lepton and a W plus minus, right, then the lepton family number is conserved. Right, if you have a lepton here and a W, right, lepton family number is always conserved. For example, here. Lepton family number conserved. And we don't have this restriction for quarks. No such restriction for quarks. electron can never decay into a neutrino muon, but an s quark can decay into an up quark. Okay, think of it for a second. All right, you're all with me? Why is the neutron scoring quarks? Why not? It doesn't bar your number of the that's all? Sorry? It doesn't bar your number of what's in the concern? Family number. Number yes, but not the, the charge yes. We don't have this in the weak interaction. Um, the electron so can't, can't, the electron can't uh, turn into air. You said something about an electron. You said electron cannot turn into a neutrino mu, which is not electron neutrino, okay. because the lepton family number is conserved. In the weak interactions, specifically the weak interactions, the restrictions on quarks do not exist. Right? So there is some sort of a coupling constant. Uh, uh, for different processes. Uh, uh, but, you know, again, charged, weak, only. Charged, weak interactions uh, can change the quark generation. that 
the unusual currents we don't have, right? The Z would not do that. Uh, so, you know, we can, that basically goes back to the question I was asked uh, a while ago. Uh, so that means that there is some mixing. There is a mixing between work generations. Uh, for example, we can write down the B prime S prime is equal to cosine theta C, sine theta C it's called, sine theta C minus sine theta C and cosine theta C of B and S. Theta C it has a name, this is called the Kabibo angle. Nicola Cabibo. So, if you accept that, it means that when we have a charged weak interaction, right? Charged weak interaction, meaning the W. That can connect the up and the prime or C and S prime. So we can have one can have that U goes to down uh, W and down prime. Is W B cosine theta plus W S sine theta theta cubic of course. Which means you all with me? Yeah. At least uh, I'm not hundred percent sure. There is a mixing. Cubic angle is measured. It's about fourteen degrees, right? And there is a mixing between different quark generations. That mixing occurs only when Ws are involved, plus or minus. They don't exist in any other of the interactions. Right? So we have this interaction with W. This will not change the, the lepton family number, but you can have an interaction in which, for example, an up quark right, will turn into a Basically, we can think of it as a down quark with a W, right? W plus, right? Or it can also turn into an S quark with a W plus. Okay. It's not limited. And we can think of this coupling. So this G weak or left on. G weak cosine theta cabibo for the same generation quarks and g uh, weak sine theta cabibo for uh, different generation quarks theta cabibo is about 14 degrees. Why? I don't know, because that's what Mother Nature wants. And that automatically means this is something which is measured. Right? So that means that the ratio between the cross section of an up quark to decay into an S quark and an up quark to decay into a down quark is a what? It's actually written here. Yes, Tangent so of theta cabibo prime. So g w squared sine squared theta cabibo divided by g weak squared cosine squared theta cabibo, which is about 1 over 20. And about 5% of the weak interactions 
an up convert into a S rather than a down. Because sigma is proportional to sin squared. No sin squared. Now, why is it written in terms of the down and S and not that up and the charm? Historically, because S was discovered before the charm. Okay. Uh, now, of course, this is for down and S. And Kabibo, I think it was 1962 or 3. Don't, don't get my word right. But of course, we can expand that. Right? Is that clear what I'm saying here? So this can be expanded. Uh, there is no limitation on only two uh, generations, right? We know that quarks come with three gen generations, so we can write a matrix with the three generations. Okay? So now, extend B prime, S prime, and B prime. Okay, so we are V. Well, U V, V U S, V U B, uh, V C B, V C S, V C B, V T B, V T S, V T B, of B S and B. Now this matrix has a name. This is called the Kabibo Kobayashi Moskawa. This is Kabibo, Kobayashi, and Moskawa. In short, this is CKM matrix. Which essentially tells you that there is a chance of a quark in one generation using the weak interaction to decay into a quark or transfer into a quark or have an interaction with, uh, you know, have a quark interacting with an electron and it will end up with a quark of a different generation. Which is quite cool. Now if you put the values, this is a unitary matrix. So the CK matrix is unitary. Um, The values of the matrix are not predicted by the standard model. Everything is measured. It's still unitary? What? It's still unitary, although... Yeah, yeah. Unitary, that makes sense, because, uh, you know, a particle will decay, a quark cannot disappear or, or reappear. So it has to be a uh, unitary, because if you start with a D quark, you have, have to end up in either a D, S, or B quark. It's not that the values are measured independently. Yeah, yeah, all the bars are nine right. values were yeah. measured independently. Yes. As you'll see, I'll just give you the values, the measured values. So none of these values is predicted. There's nothing in the standard model to tell you what the values are. But uh, the VCKM approximately 0 0.974, 0 0.225, 0 0.004. Uh, this is of course the absolute values, right? It's all, all it's all uh, complex, but it's absolute values. So 0 0.225, 0 0.973, 0 0.041, 0 0.009, 0 0.001, 0 0.040, and 0 0.999. So the diagonal elements is yourself the same generation transition. Right? So it's more likely that if you start with a B, you'll end up with a B. Right? But there is some chance that it will not. Uh, these are sometimes called the weak eigenstates. Uh, eigenstates. And these are called the mass eigenstates. Uh, okay, I have an example, I'm not sure it's called, it's called a gene. Uh, Blasio Eliopoulos Miani, 
Um, I think I might just skip it. To, uh, so we just. Um, I'll skip it for now. I'll put it on the on the web page so you can read it. It's not that crucial. I think that's uh, just to read about it for the gym. It's called the uh, Jewish Glasho. Glasho Iliopolis and Man. mechanism that was used that to predict the existence of new particles. Right, which I think I'm going to skip again due to because I feel that people are getting quiet, exhausted. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how can you be sure that uh, the lepton is not changing generation, assuming that uh, neutrinos are mixing uh, eventually? Experimentally. Mm -hmm. Everything I said is experimental. What is the experiment? Any, any experiment involved in weak interaction. You never find any in, any experiment in which an electron turns into a new neutrino. It in doesn't happen. In experiments, we, we don't find neutrons. The neutrinos. We do. The, the, there is no detector for neutrinos. First, there are detectors for neutrinos. Uh, okay. Is it part of. Uh, so there are detectors for neutrinos. Um, in in uh, sediment, please? That I need to that I need to check. I know of several places for neutrinos which are separated. I, that I need to check what they do search. As far as I know, they simply been observed. But uh, you're right. I'll check this. Okay, and, and yes, just uh, again, uh, you said mass eigenstates mm -hmm. and weak eigenstates. What I understand from that is that when a quark is happily free, is on its mass eigenstates, and when wants to interact, to, to go into a weak interaction, it sort of splits into other quarks for the purpose of interaction. The interaction it's happens... Not for the purpose of interaction. No, not for the purpose, but if we calculate, then it means that one quark, which was D, is sort of splitting into DSB in the interactions. It's one way of looking at that. Okay. Mm -hmm. The experimental fact is that you start with a D quark and you don't always end with a D quark. Mm -hmm. You have a 97% of ending with a D quark, but you have some percentage of ending in S quark with a D quark. It's a very small, but it's there. All right. Okay. Any further questions or comments? You said flavor ch change, you, you mean that the Z boson will never change? Yeah, the Z is going to happen. Only with the W. A, a transition between... Yeah, it, that does not exist for interactions that they involve this. Only charge. All right? Okay, so have a good weekend. I'm going to see you all on... Uh, you. Well, not next week. Two weeks, just like as usual for the last two weeks. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to אין במודל הסטנדרטי, רגע בוא נתחיל, הקטע האוניטרי פשוט אומר שהחלקים לא נוצרים ולא נעלמים, אותך תמידי אתה חייב לסיים עם משהו, זה האוניטרי, הערכים, the values that you have here, there is no 
the standard model does not give you any prediction. Right? There, nothing in the standard model tells you what there should be. So it just measures experiment. And then you ask the third time if you want to. No, yeah, you have to start with something. I mean, you don't. You, you never see in nature that you start with one quark and then you end up with nothing. So you start with one quark. In any interaction that you start with a quark, you end up with a quark. It just doesn't have to be the same quark. Okay. For me, this is not strange. I mean, the fact that and so it's obvious to me that you know you measure. You start with a d. I mean, how do you measure that? Right? You make an experiment. You start with a D, and you see how many uh, okay, times you'll exactly. get a D, how many you'll get an S, how many you get a B. Total, you get 100%. Right? You don't, you don't lose Ds and you don't generate them. You start with 100 Ds, you end up with 100, with 100 uh, quarks, but not 100 Ds. Oh, this is a so in that sense, <laughs> in, in that sense, the fact that it's unitary does not surprise me at all. Right? The values here are are not uh, predictable by the model. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same point. B1, S, D, F, S. Two of them are equal to F. So here, the model is going to affect the vector. Is it? Is it? If I don't... 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 If I don't